Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We're thrilled to have photographer and editor Gary Hershorn as tonight's guest speaker. Gary's career began in 1979, working for the United Press International in Canada. Six years later, he was hired by Reuters. During his 29-year career at Reuters, Gary worked as a photographer in Toronto and Washington, D.C., and as picture editor for the Americas, and later global sports pictures editor. As a photographer, he has covered 17 Olympic Games, 24 Masters Golf Tournaments, an equal number of Academy Awards, along with numerous majors, major news events around the world. At present, Gary is the photo editor for foxnews.com. He is also a contributing photographer at Getty Images and continues to work on an ongoing personal project documenting the changing skyline of New York City. Please help me welcome Gary Hershon to our lecture series. Um, one of the things that I always tell people when they see these pictures is that none of them are random. Every picture you see is basically plotted on this little map and this graph and you can follow the lines and see when the sunrise or the moon rises and moon sets and you can absolutely figure out where you have to go. And, and by using the app, you can also shorten the amount of time you spend actually photographing. So if you're doing a moonrise, you can go out and do it in five minutes. And, in, and on a cold winter day, that's a really helpful thing. You know, you don't want to be out there too long when it's minus, minus 40, uh, you know, out there. So uh, I do live in Hoboken. Uh, I've been in the New York area now for, since 2005. Uh, I came to New York for the first time. Uh, in the 70s, I think it was 1978 when I made my first trip to New York City. Uh, I was 20 years old and I fell in love with this city like there was no other city in the world. Uh, I knew right then uh, when I started there that, or when I came here the first time, that I wanted to live here someday. You know, I just didn't know what it was going to take from 1978 to 2005 to accomplish that. We were talking about me being in D.C. I went to D.C. for three years, ended up staying for 15. It was like, you know, 14 years, 364 days too long. It was just a, a, you know, a horrible, boring city back in the 90s. Um, uh, it was good. Uh, I was working for Reuters. I spent a lot of time photographing Bill Clinton back in, uh, in the 90s uh, for eight years, and uh, it was interesting doing that. But most of my time was spent uh, uh, being a sports photographer, uh, running around the world with Brad Smith back there, you know, uh, with Brad, who was at Sports Illustrated. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, um, uh, are, uh, how many here are born, born and raised in New York? A lot, yeah. And, and everybody, all the others here, uh, you hope to stay here for a long time? It is the greatest place in the world, right? You know, um, uh, I, I'm going to show you 10 quick pictures of uh, my previous life, some, you know, five news, five sports. I'm going to then show you some pictures uh, and get into uh, where I got the inspiration of starting this project on New York City. And it's been an ongoing, you know, it's been an ongoing project that started for me in the uh, summer of 2011. And uh, that was a very uh, big, in the news business, and I think, you know, in general, it was a really big, um, big summer because it was the... Uh, the time leading up to the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And the world uh, focused their eyes a lot on New York City. You know, for those of us who are working at Reuters or AP or Getty, uh, the, the appetite for pictures of New York to be published around the world was huge, absolutely huge. But we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. So if you have any questions, you know, during, don't hesitate, you know, shout them out if you need to, uh, if you see something and you want to ask a question about it. So like I say, uh, Washington, you know, this goes back to the 80s, Reagan and Gorbachev when the, uh, you know, the, the, uh, after the Berlin, Berlin Wall fell and, and Russia went uh, more democratic. Um, this was a picture I was very proud of. This was uh, John John, John Kennedy, um, at his mom's funeral, Jackie, okay, ja her, at her, uh, sorry, at his mom's burial in Arlington Cemetery. And, and I was really proud about this picture and, and it played all over the world on the front pages because... John John had never been photographed at his father's grave before. You know, whenever he went on the anniversaries, he, he never went on the day of his father's death so that he couldn't uh, be photographed. And we were there with the White House pool, three photographers, one from AP, one from AFP, one from Reuters. And um, I was waiting for this moment. I, th I just had in my head this moment was going to happen. He was going to touch his father's, uh, he was going to do something with his father's gravestone. 
And, and sure enough, he walked over to it and he just swiped his hand on it and, and walked away. And the, lucky, uh, the luckiness that I had that day was the AEP photographer was out of focus on this picture and the AFP photographer ran out of film. Back then, it was only film, not digital, 36 pictures, and uh, you know, nothing was worse than when you're pushing the button and click nothing. So uh, I had like a world exclusive on that, and I was really happy to, uh, to have had that picture. Um, another big moment at the White House uh, when Arafat and Rabin shook hands. Um, there's a big moment that, uh, you know, as a photographer, um, you know, you're always looking for something different. You want to do something, you know, at something that uh, stands out, right? This is Obama's election on, um, uh, in November of 2008. Uh, we were allowed to set up cameras. There was a, a wall here. We, had to, we were allowed to put cameras at the top of the wall. I was uh, thinking that, um, I, I remembered back in, in August of that year when they had the convention in Denver, this was the kind of lighting that they lit the, um, the stage for Obama to walk out on the night that he gave his speech. You know, Thursday night, the, uh, the candidate gives their speech. And so in Denver, it was in a big stadium, he walked out and they had all this spotlighting creating the shadow. So I, I had no idea that they were going to do that again, but I assumed they would do it. And I used a wide-angle lens to try and get the shadow. And it worked out quite nicely, and uh, most of the other photographers had long lenses zoomed in on the podium where he was going to give his speech, so that at the end of his speech, they would have him waving and the people. And one of the other reasons I, 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 I did the wide-angle lens is, that's me, right there. <laughs> I wanted to be in the picture. You know, so we were using radio remotes to, uh, to trigger the cameras, and uh, uh, that was a great historical moment. And some of you may have remembered this uh, event here in New York. Um, uh, that was shot out my window at Reuters from uh, the 19th floor of Reuters at uh, 7th and 42nd Street. It just so happened that the plane floated between buildings and we could see it from, from our office. And uh, we were the only ones that had a picture like that at Reuters uh, for like eight hours before somebody uh, else who had a picture uh, surfaced with it. It's also a very memorable, mo this is actually a, a very memorable moment um, because it was like around 2010, the iPhone had just come out and it was the first time, you know, you talk about citizen journalism, there was a person on the ferry who took a picture out the window of the ferry that uh, they put on Twitter that was used all over the world in, in, the, in the real first explosion of uh, a citizen journalism, uh, you know, moment. Um, and a bunch of happy people back on Inauguration Day in, uh, in Washington. They were just thrilled. It was a happy day. Uh, so going back uh, to sports, this was a World Cup. Maradona, one of the greatest uh, soccer players ever, uh, winning the World Cup in Mexico in 86. Had to put the New York Rangers, last Stanley Cup, and probably the only Stanley Cup they're ever going to win again. Right, Brett? <laughs> um, Usain Bolt uh, winning the 100 meters in... Um, in Beijing, uh, Michael, uh, Michael Phelps saying goodbye in Rio after his final Olympic uh, race. So here we go, uh, New York City, 1978. There I am with my sister on the top of the World Trade Center. Um, it, was, uh, it was a mesmerizing view. It was an incredible um, place to be. Uh, New York City was a lot different then than it is now. You know, that's, uh, you know, I don't know, what would we do if that was the subways? How would we you know, feel about that? And, in today's world. Uh, Times Square had uh, basically the same feel. It's not a whole lot different now. There's just more signs, more, uh, you know, more visual pollution, but it was uh, pretty, you know, massive there. Uh, that was from the uh, Empire State Building, looking, looking south to uh, lower Manhattan. And that's looking north from, uh, from the observation deck at the, the World Trade Center. So I was talking about uh, the summer of 2011. Um, that was where I got all my creative juices flowing, and I was not a creative photographer. I was not a, a feature photographer. I was a hardcore news and sports photographer. I didn't look for light. I didn't try to do anything uh, beyond showing up at an event, seeing what the light was, working within the confines of that light. You know, usually it was a stadium or, you know, maybe, you know, it was um, um, an, an, an indoor stadium or an indoor venue, and there's lights like this that you'd have to work in. But in the summer of 2011, um, the world's attention was on New York City, and, and everybody wanted to see how New York was, was adapting 10 years after the fact. 
you know, of the attacks. And, you know, um, you know from, for anybody who, who lived here, you know, through 2001 to 2011, I think you probably remember how um, dormant the city was. There was no construction going on. It was in the summer of 2011 that One World Trade Center actually started to come out of the ground and we started to see uh, a rebirth of, uh, of Lower Manhattan. Uh, the, like I say, the world's attention was very much focused on, on New York City. And, and every photographer working for every newspaper and wire service was trying to figure out a way to show New York off in a different way. And, and this was the, uh, you know, 2011's, you know, cell phones were just kind of starting. Uh, there were things like uh, apps like uh, Hipstamatic. Anybody use Hipstamatic? It was that, uh, that app on, a, on an iPhone that made your, your pictures green. But every th everybody thought it was cool. It was the first filtering done on a, on a digital file. And uh, people were using Holgas and lens babies and wide lux cameras and anything. I chose to use a, a, a mobile phone with uh, most of the stuff that I shot was um, a Polaroid frame around it. And uh, um, what I noticed about my walking up and down the Hudson River on the Jersey side was how many people just stared at Lower Manhattan. It was, it was eerie in that summer, you know, People like, like this gentleman, they were just watching. I can't imagine what they were thinking. I didn't want to, one thing you'll see in, in, sorry, in my pictures is that there's really no recognizable faces. I don't like to have, I like to have people in my pictures, but I don't like to see their face. I want the city to be what you look at, not a person's face. Other people do street photography and they, they show the, the, um, the, the characters of New York City. And uh, I just try to use people for scale and, and perspective. And, uh, um, usually from behind like that. You know, I don't want to see their face, but I'm, I'm wondering, what are they thinking of? They're looking at Ground Zero, they're looking at, you know, Lower Manhattan. And to me, Lower Manhattan looks flat. You know, without those tall buildings, I'm just amazed, you know, uh, a few short years ago, how, to me, it just feels low. Um, another view. You see, again, more people just, you know, a guy walking with his, uh, his baby, and he just stops and stares. It was just, it was, it was the thing that happened you know, in that summer. Uh, and this was uh, also the year they lit uh, the World Trade Center in red, white, and blue when they had the Tribute in Light that night. So the next thing that um, I can talk about is uh, the moon. Uh, for anybody who follows my Instagram feed, you'll know that I do a lot of what you could call celestial events over in New York, sunrise, moonrise, moon sets, things like that. So this was, um, something called a supermoon. We've all heard that term now, right? It's like, uh, it's like the buzzword of uh, the month. Uh, oh, there's a super, and guess what? On, on March 20th, next week, there's another supermoon. And, and does anybody know what a supermoon actually is? You know, supermoon for real happens like every year and a half or so. And it is, it is referred to the orbit the moon makes around the Earth at the closest point it can ever come to the Earth which is 221,000 miles away. So this was a true supermoon. And it's funny that, you know, this was uh, in May of uh, 2012. And I had never heard the term supermoon before. I don't know why this moon, maybe, you know, um, um, maybe uh, it was like the first supermoon in like almost two years to, to rise. And, and it, was, it was something that I, I, I had to go photograph. You know, what's a supermoon? You gotta go look at it. So this picture um, was shot from a place called Eagle Rock Reservation. It's out in South Orange, kind of like near Montclair, if you know where that is. It's 13 miles from the city. And there's this incredible vista there. It's a park, and you can stand there, and you can see Manhattan from, from uh, lower Manhattan all the way to uh, the Bronx. And you have this great vista. And, and the moon, I knew using the apps. I knew the moon was, even then, the apps were, were available back then. Um, I, I knew the moon was going to rise behind lower Manhattan. So um, when it came up like that, it was like, it was like that wow moment. It was that thing that, that said, i got to do this. So unfortunately, I became obsessed, and I do it every month. You know, I mean, I go chase a full moon every single month. And like I say, the next one is next uh, Wednesday night, March 20th, is the next uh, full moon. Because you know, you for you know, there are there are uh, you know, one full moon a month. You get 12 shots at the full moon uh, in New York or anywhere, and you uh, can count on at least four of them being cloudy. 
So you really don't have uh, you know, that many attempts at it. And uh, you really only get one day a month where the light is perfect to photograph the moon rising. And um, I'm not a big fan of the moon against a black sky. I kind of like the moon. Uh, the day before a full moon is usually the nicest time to go up because when the moon comes up, you can photograph it higher and keep the uh, ambient light in the sky and the, the tone in the moon rather than, than having a white sky, or sorry, a white dot against the sky. So what I'm going to show you tonight uh, is basically one year's work. Uh, I'm not uh, a photographer who likes to, um, you know, uh, live on his laurels and say, oh, this is from 19... You know, 99, and this is from 2002. You know, what I like to uh, to do to inspire you know people is is this is what's been available in New York for the last year, and every year is the same. You know, there's a lot of repetition when you're photographing uh, a city like New York. You know, you go out over and over and over again to the same places to photograph uh, whether it's a moon or just the sunset or whatever because you never know what the light's going to be. Every single morning, every single night, the color of the light is different. And the moon is in a different place every, every uh, full moon when it comes up. And it is, uh, I, I don't just restrict myself to doing the full moon. The moon comes up every day. Every day the moon comes up 45 minutes later every day. There's just a, a week where it comes up uh, leading into sunset and the full moon always rises uh, um, the full moon always rises in, in conjunction with the sun going down. They're always timed at the same time, basically. So um, you'll see what I've done in the last year. Um, snow, there's no city more beautiful than snow than New York City. It's magical for about, um, for about uh, six hours. And then it all turns brown and it's just the ugliest, messiest thing ever, right? So this is Fifth Avenue. Um, we all heard of Manhattan Hinge. Have anybody photographed Manhattan Hinge here? Go out there for sunset. Have anybody done Sunrise Manhattan Hinge? Anybody realize? Yeah? Anybody realize there is actual Sunrise Manhattan Hinge? This is from near where, where Katrine lives in Weehawken. And uh, this was, uh, we get a, uh, like you get Sunset Manhattan Hinge for two days in May and two days in July. You get Sunrise Manhattan Hinge two days at the end of uh, November and two days in mid-January. So uh, uh, this one was uh, in, in mid-January last, uh, last year, and it's 42nd Street, and it's uh, quite a beautiful picture. And in we this is from Weehawken, New Jersey, and the beautiful thing about Weehawken is uh, you can either go down to the river like this, or you can go up, uh, uh, there's a, a cliff, pardon? King's Bluff. King's Bluff, yeah, and you can go up to King's Bluff, and you can stand in exactly the same spot, but up high, and get a completely different view, which I'll show you. Uh, a little later. Uh, Statue of Liberty, uh, number one icon in New York, without a doubt, by, by, by a long shot. When you, when you do pictures of the Statue of Liberty and you put them on social media, she gets more likes than any other, uh, than any other icon. Uh, and the beautiful thing about our, our city is there are no other cities in the world that have as many recognizable, iconic landmarks. And one of the things when you, when you do urban photography or urban landscapes, um, it's always important to have one of the icons in your picture so that it is instantly recognizable as New York City. And I try to you know, focus on um, the statue, One World Trade Center, Lower Manhattan as a skyline and a shape is, is very uh, iconic and recognizable. Empire State Building, um, Chrysler Building, uh, the buildings along uh, Times Square, and now we have 40, now we have Hudson Yards, you know, on the, uh, on the west side at the end of 30, uh, 30th Street and 30, uh, you know, to 34th Street. Uh, it's an iconic, you know, shape that has been added to the skyline. And, and now we also have uh, Billionaire's Row, all those horrible, ugly buildings along 57th Street that are, you know, casting these long shadows into Central Park and, and dominating the skyline of New York City. Um, so you'll see a lot of moon rises. Uh, this is uh, uh, from the South Street Seaport. Three bridges, right? You got the uh, Williamsburg Bridge, you got the Manhattan Bridge, and you got the Brooklyn Bridge. And it's just from the, you know, it's just again knowing, uh, reading the app and knowing exactly on the app where to where to stand to get the moon coming up. Um, I wanted to get it up between the two bridges at the top, but the uh, it was cloudy and it disappeared into the clouds. So uh, it doesn't line, you know, and again, it doesn't line up that much. You you have to keep your eye on the app and, and, and keep looking every month to see and plan out um, where you might want to, where you need to stand or what month this might actually happen again. So, um, uh, that's um, uh, 
taken up around uh, Edgewater, a little north of Weehawken, and uh, you know there's a lot of reflective light. The beautiful thing on the Jersey side is you get a lot of reflective light off of uh, the glass buildings along the skyline. Uh, I live in Hoboken, so it's really simple for me to uh, to to go up and down um, the river, up and down the Hudson River. Uh, I joke a lot with with people, uh, you know, friends of uh, mine, photographer friends who who live in Brooklyn, and everybody, all the photographers live in Brooklyn, right? It's a cool place to live, they tell me. But I live in Hoboken, and I live in Jersey. I think we have a better view of the skyline uh, in, 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 in Jersey than from uh, Brooklyn and Queens. I think uh, there's too much uh, building that has gone on along the East River that has put up walls of uh, um, uh, buildings in front of uh, you know, the Empire State Building or the World Trade Center. You know, we have places where we can see the World Trade Center from top to bottom in Jersey City, and you can't do that in Brooklyn. The other really big advantage about being on the Jersey side is I can drive up and down the, uh, the coast, <laughs> up and down the river, from the George Washington Bridge uh, in the north to Bayonne in the south and find free parking in every spot that I want to take a picture from. And it makes a huge difference if you can drive to where you want to take those pictures from. And there's about 16 spots, you know, with, with fantastic uh, uh, vistas and vantage points to, uh, to photograph the city. So this is fog. Fog is my favorite kind of weather to, to photograph in. The clock tower is in Hoboken. The Empire State Building is about a mile across the river. A uh, mile and a half, and uh, it's nice to uh, just put them together. You know, more fog. Um, this always happens like once, you know, a spring. You know, where where you get like a 70 degree day, and and the Hudson River in the winter, and the Hudson River is is still cold, and all the steam rises up off the river. So uh, keep your eye out for that. If you ever see a spike in the temperature. Um, you know, like you say, none of this is random. You know, it's not like, oh, geez, I went out to the river and found fog. You know, it was like this was a 65 degree day, and, and it's like, gotta go to the river, you know. The other trick I'll give you, or the other trick I'll tell you is um, EarthCam. You know, they have an app, and um, I use EarthCam religiously. You know, they have an app, and for five dollars, you get access to every Earth cam there is. So there's a there's a camera on in Jersey City that looks two cameras in Jersey City that look at um, that look at um, um, uh, World Trade Center, and then there's one that uh, is near the World Trade Center that looks out on the New York Harbor. So I can sit in bed like before uh, before um, uh, a sunrise, and you know I can wake up and I can. Go to my Earth Cam, and I can see what um, uh, the weather's. I can see if there's clouds or if it's clear, and I can make a decision about whether or not I'm going to uh, go out and photograph that morning. You know, so um, all the tricks. There's a lot of tricks. There's a lot of technology out there that you can use to make your life easier as a photographer when you're when you're photographing a city. So we can go through this. Um, um, this is uh, just after the sun goes down, blue hour in New York City. Uh, it's from the uh, observation deck at World Trade Center. That's the view from the lower Manhattan to, to the north. Uh, again, the reflective light uh, happens. You know, this is in Hoboken. This kind of light where the, the sun flares off of the World Trade Center will happen for about four days. And then the sun is, you know, not going to hit the building in the, same, in the same way. So one of the things to keep in mind is these, these opportunities to get this kind of thing you know, come and go in days, not, not like weeks. You know, it's just, it, it's, it's a very, very short period of time in a very specific month. And, and that's, um, you know, the one thing that I have not figured out is, is how to plan for getting the, the flares. You know, it's just something that happens to be there when you're, when you're going out a lot. Um, sometimes, like the plane in the river, you just look out your win office window and there's a, there's a picture out there on the street. Um, Hudson Yards, so anybody like this uh, development, you know, it's opening on Friday, well the mall is opening on Friday, you know, so with Hudson Yards, this gray building here that connects these two buildings, that's the sixth floor mall, it opens Friday, you know, sometime Friday, and anybody planning to go here to the vessel, this the staircase, um, you know, it's uh, opening, well, it opens on Friday also, but I don't think the public can go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I have a ticket to uh, go on to climb it on Monday afternoon at sunset. So you have to book a ticket if you want to climb this. They have 16 floors of of staircases to uh, to to get a good workout with. Um, 
a lot of cruise ships, uh, you know, the, the, the worst thing that's happening with all this development in New York City is we're losing classic views of iconic buildings. Standing in this spot, you used to be able to see the Empire State Building, and now it's gone from that, uh, that angle. And it's happening all over the city. We're losing views left, right, and center. And, and I, 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 they say it's progress. The uh, developers say it's, you know, it's, it's, it's making New York more majestic, but it's taking away pictures that uh, you know, have been shot for you know, 100 years. And, and I find that really sad to, to think about. Um, one of my pet peeves is I hate railings. You know, when you walk along the river, whether it's the East River or the Hudson River, there's walkways, you know, forever, but they all have railings. But on the Jersey side, there are two or three places you can go where you can walk right into the Hudson River from a park. And I love being able to get down low and, and you know, a ferry goes by, splashes the water, and, uh, you know, it's out there at sunset. Uh, again, th th this one was, uh, this is in Jersey City. Um, down the far end of Jersey City in Paulus Hook. This is in Hoboken where we have a little beach in Hoboken where they, they launch uh, kayaks and canoes and things like that. Um, the moon and the Statue of Liberty, it's an unbeatable combination. You know, it's uh, every time, um, you can't get it every month, maybe six out of 12 months, the moon on, when it rises lines up with the Statue of Liberty. Um, Two different nights. Again, to show you, this is the moon rising uh, right at sunset and from sort of the same place but a little farther back. This is the moon a couple nights later rising in the dark. It's not quite full here and you can see the difference. Um, you know, and, and you know, here you get a brighter moon but you get a little detail in it and you got all the sky and it's very nice and uh, a few nights later you're focusing just on the moon and the light of the moon being orange when it, uh, when it rises. The lower the moon is on the skyline, the brighter orange it's going to be. Brett. The question is, is uh, I have a lot of information and, and whether or not I'm keeping a journal so that I can refer back to the journal to decide where maybe, you know, the, the year later to, to go uh, to the same spot. Uh, I don't uh, do that because the moon never rises in the same place like June to June. For example, um, it, uh, the moon is on a 28-day elliptical orbit, so over the course of a year or a year and a half, it, 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 it's, it's not, uh, there's not an equivalency to if it rises here in June of 2018, it's going to rise here in June 2019, it may rise there. So the journal's not really, uh, it might help with maybe the flares off of buildings, it might put you in the, in the vicinity of um, uh, the week or the time frame, but uh, I, 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 it's too much work. <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, the, one of the biggest jokes that I, I have on my uh, Instagram feed is uh, there's a, everybody uses a hashtag, uh, does Gary ever sleep? Because uh, I go out for sunrise, I go out for sunset and stuff like that. But, you know, I always remind people that the sun sets in the winter around 4.15. I don't go to sleep at 4.30 or 4 o'clock, you know, and, um, and in the winter the, uh, the, it, the sun rises like at 7, 7.15, like it is right now with the, with the time change. And uh, so there's a lot of time between 4 and 7 to sleep. So, you know, it's pretty simple. Um, you know, again, this is Weehawken. It's one of my favorite, Hamilton Park in Weehawken. It's one of my favorite places to photograph. We're back in the fog and the rain. Um, I love the, the, the perspective of standing back with a telephoto lens, capturing somebody in front of the, uh, the skyline. I like to make people equal in size, in many cases, or bigger than the actual buildings in the skyline. You know, play with, uh, you know, have a little fun with playing with perspective and, 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 and a different look. Uh, we all are chasing golden, you know, golden, you know, sunset. Uh, this was for uh, the Chrysler Building, which was just sold last week for a paltry $150 million. Um, I didn't think, uh, a lot of people didn't think it was going to sell at all. The, the, uh, the people that owned it uh, bought it for $800 million uh, many years ago, and they took all a bath on it and selling it for $150 million. Uh, just you know, like I say, the, the, the deal closed last week, and, and the reason that it sold for so little is, is the building can't be modernized. Uh, there's a number of reasons. One is the, the owners of the building do not own the land that the building sits on. The, build, the land that the building is on is owned by Cooper Union, and Cooper Union just raised the rent to like $30 million a year, and, and in another five years it's going to 42 or $45 million a year. 
So that in itself kept people from wanting to buy the, uh, the building. And the other problem is uh, they can't modernize the building. You know, it can't, you know, there's a lot of pillars inside. The office is, space is small. But it sold. Thankfully, it sold. And uh, somebody will, will maintain it. It is, you know, truly maybe the most beautiful building in, in New York. Um, again, reflective light, just silhouette somebody, you know, put them in that light and uh, get a, you know, a sense of the vista. Uh, again, Weehawken, and you know, it's always fun to have people. Well, oh, they were kissing, you know, not planned, just uh, something that you capture when you're when you're out there. Um, I do a lot of low-level photography. Put the camera on the ground, put it in the grass, you know, try something. You know, one of the reasons that you I can put it in the, you know, one of the reasons I'll put it down low is it cleans up all the other buildings. You know, you can just see the tops of some of these other buildings and. If you put it down low enough, you can clean out all the low buildings and just have the highest one and give it a, uh, you know, make sure that the, the Empire State Building, uh, you know, stands out a little more. Uh, this is uh, a full moon rise from the, uh, um, uh, the West Side Highway and 42nd Street. Um, normally, I would shoot that from Weehawken, and there are, I'll show you what it looks like, but uh, I wanted to try one from ground level. I wasn't all that happy with it. I think it's still better from... Uh, Weehawken. I spent a lot of time in the gutter of New York, in the gutters of New York. You know, if you're ever shooting a reflection, you know, one of the things that you need to do is make sure that the bottom of your camera is wet. If your camera is not on top of the water, you will not have a proper reflection. You'll be too high, and the space between here, the higher the camera, the wider this gets. And you want to narrow this space here so that it's almost like a perfect mirror. So, you know, got to get the bottom of your camera wet, you know, and then dry it off really fast, but you got to get it wet. I've never wrecked a camera yet because of it, but uh, I, uh, again, low level. You know, low, when, you're, when you're looking up at something, there's a dramatic feel to it. It's, it, it gives something uh, a little more stature, so uh, that's in Hoboken. Um, telephoto lenses. I shoot a lot of telephoto lenses. Uh, one of my tricks about uh, photographing with long lenses is I have a little Canon mirrorless camera, it's called an M5. It's a one inch sensor and Canon makes an adapter to put regular Canon EF lenses on it that you would use on a 5D or a 1DX or, or whatever. And it doubles the focal length when you put it on this little mirrorless camera. So I have a little 300 f4 camera, or lens and a little 400.56. So when I put it on my Canon mirrorless camera, my M5, I get a 600 and 800 millimeter lens. So I use those for the moon rises. You know, all the moon rises that I shoot are, are usually shot with that. So, Wait, that's like 800? 800 millimeters, yeah. So, you know, you know, this picture here is shot like from a block away from where these people are. I think it was a 600 millimeter lens looking down uh, 42nd Street. Um, one of the things that, uh, that's really nice is, is um, after you have Manhattan Henge in May, right, the sun is now setting, for, when the sun sets, it has to pass by 42nd Street. So what happens is, uh, the sun is directly behind me here. This is like a day or two after the first Manhattan Hinge in May. It illuminates 42nd Street from, from New York all the way to uh, Queens in the background. And the whole street lights up in sunlight. And it, it's, it's quite a beautiful effect. You know, it's just chasing light. You know, New York has the most beautiful light. It's, it's, it's everywhere. And the best thing about living in New York and being a photographer in New York is, is uh, you know, they tell, they tell you never to photograph, you know, at high noon, you know, when the sun is at the highest point in the sky. That's one of the best times to photograph in New York because the light bounces around off glass, you know, windows and you get reflective light and backlight and, and you get all this incredible weird streaks of light coming through buildings, you know, when the, when the sun is up high, especially as it's uh, moving down at the bottom of lower Manhattan and it's shooting right up Fifth Avenue or it's coming up Seventh Avenue or Sixth Avenue, you know, it's really beautiful to, to photograph directly into the light, you know, at, at the time of day when they tell you it's the worst light to be photographing in, so. Um, Brooklyn Bridge, you know, what's better than walking around across the Brooklyn Bridge at sunset on a summer night, you know, it's just uh, spectacular to to it, you know, and, and we have so many opportunities in New York, you know, whether it's walking across the Brooklyn Bridge or the, the Manhattan Bridge or the Williamsburg Bridge, you know, these, these, you know, 
whoever built them, you know, they thought about the foot traffic, they thought about pedestrians, and it was just, you know, we thank, I'm, I say, I'm so thankful that, uh, you know, these opportunities exist in this city. Um, I have fun with birds. I love birds and geese, and I love, having, you know, playing around with them. Uh, moonrise, goose. I'm Canadian. I look for my Canadian cousins and uh, photograph them a lot. So this was a moonrise. We saw the moonrise down 42nd Street from ground. This is the moonrise from Kings Bluff in, in Weehawken. This usually happens in uh, June, you, June or July. Usually you get the moon pass, rising and passing through the 42nd Street Canyon. So, um, and also um, you get a little bit of reflective light off uh, sunset uh, that night to get to some orange in the buildings. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a classic New York picture now is, is you know, this, uh, this um, you know, orange moon. Um, and, and it's, it, they also, you know, June, it's also called the strawberry moon. Not because it's red, it's because it's for the strawberry harvest, but uh, everybody has this uh, fascination and romance with, uh, with the strawberry moon. So I always hope that the June moon is uh, not clouded out and we can actually, actually see it. Fireworks, everybody love a good fireworks show? This is, um, this is 40, 4th of July. Um, the the um, uh, standard thing for a photographer is to go to Brooklyn or Queens to photograph the fireworks because they're on the East River and people want to see the fireworks. They want to, you know, you know be underneath them and, and, and really enjoy the beauty of them. I, when I knew the fireworks, this is shot from Jersey City. So this is across Manhattan to, um, to the other side. And the reason that I do that is if you go to Brooklyn or Queens and do f fireworks, you get giant fireworks in a tiny little city because you've got to use a really wide angle lens. At the bottom of your frame, you have a very small, you know, you know New York City. And, and if I go to Jersey City, I get big fireworks, big buildings. And it just, uh, you know, the telephoto lens compresses it all. And uh, the fireworks only work, if you're going to do this, uh, from Jersey City, they only work when they have the barges up around 34th to 42nd Street. Some years they put the barges down to um, uh, the Brooklyn Bridge, and then uh, the buildings are too high in lower Manhattan, you can't do that picture. So it's only, it only works, the last two years they've had it up uptown near 42nd Street, so it works really nice. There's a very nice flat spot to the right of the Empire State Building. Uh, Manhattan Henge at night, um, Sunset Manhattan Henge, I love it, I just love the chaos, I love the cab drivers yelling and screaming, you know, the people in the street that don't get out of the way, and um, I, again, I'll give you another little tip. Where are you in this? This picture was taken from uh, the Pershing Bridge, uh, it's, at, uh, it's, it's across 42nd Street in front of Grand Central. What time did you get there? I got there at, well, about 5.45 for an 8.15 sunset. It's, it's, there, was, there, there were 300 people on this bridge. There's, there's you know, four lanes of traffic, it reduces barely to one, and, and it's just packed. But one little tip I'll give you about uh, photographing Manhattan Hinge, um, this is shot on a mobile phone, this picture. All the pictures that I, I, I never use a phone for photography, I only use uh, cameras. Um, um, I have a camera in my pocket all the time. I don't like using my phone. Um, have more control over the exposure, more control over uh, zooming and, and stuff like that, ISO and stuff with uh, a regular camera. So, um, but on Manhattan Hinge night, if you shoot this with a regular camera, the street's going to be black because it's in shadow. And if you expose for the, the sun, the street's going to be black, the sun's going to be good. If you expose for the shadow, the sun will be overexposed and you won't see it. It'll just be white at the end. So I shot it with a mobile phone. Guess what? The mobile phones balance the light better than a camera. The camera's true, the mobile phone. The best description I ever read was when the Pixel 3, the Google Pixel 3 camera came out a few months ago. The tech writer in the Washington Post described the phone as producing the most exquisite, fake-tastic pictures ever. I thought that was a great term, fake-tastic. And it's right, you know, it's right. Who knows what they're doing, uh, what Google and Apple are doing in their image processing, but uh, it, you can't beat it. Can't beat it for, for this really difficult uh, situation. Um, that's um, the next night, you know, Manhattan Henge, um, shot with an 800 millimeter lens just by being on the street. That's the bridge I was on where those people are for the picture before. Um, that's, Pershing, that's the Pershing Square Bridge. 
and that's just shot from about 3rd Avenue and 42nd with an 800 millimeter lens as the sun was starting to make its way you know, through the, uh, through the canyon. Uh, I like to shoot through a lot of things, frame things up, you know, add something, uh, you know, add something to the picture to make it a little interesting, you know, just uh, try to find something. That's uh, a pier in Hoboken, Pier C, the entrance to it. Uh, again, foul weather, you know, you got to go out, you know, if you, it's just beautiful to be out in the rain and uh, fog and mist and, and stuff like that. It's really, really a pretty time to, uh, to photograph in New York. Uh, Washington Square is one of my favorite, you know, you know parks in the city. Um, lightning. Everybody likes a good lightning storm, right? Um, I chase lightning, you know, all, all spring and summer and fall, I chase lightning. Um, I think lightning are, are some of the most spectacular pictures in New York City, and uh, I've got a few in here. Um, again, there's a weather app that I use, it's called Radar Scope. It's a professional weather app. You, uh, you, I think it's like a $10 download, and for a $10 a year subscription, they tell you where the lightning is. So that if a storm is moving towards New York City and there's lightning in the storm, it puts Z's in the in the uh, in the clouds. You know that are in the, it's a radar app, and and so from a photographer's perspective, it's really handy to know that this particular storm has lightning. Not every storm uh, in the summer has lightning in it. So um, if I'll be at home and I see a storm forming, and the and the radar in the app is up to the minute, so it's real time. And again, lightning's not random. You know, you don't go out and just find it. You can track it on an app, and you can put yourself in a position to get it just by, by uh, watching the uh, the direction that the storms are coming in. Um, this is a this is a, a daytime storm. Really, really hard to photograph lightning in the daytime because you can't really without a neutral density filter that will, you know, blacken out your, your, um, the front of your lens and maybe, you know, allow you to do a, a 15 or 20 second exposure, which I don't have uh, on a neutral density. You have to react to it. The lightning hits and you have to push the button and sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. Um, this was another night. Um, this was another one uh, last summer. Uh, lightning is much easier to photograph at night. You can do a 30 second exposure and just keep opening the shutter. And, and um, inevitably, your camera's going to go click, the lightning's going to go off before you can open it again. I can't even begin to tell you how many times that has happened. There's also um, uh, technology out there where you can put a light sensor uh, on the top of your camera, and when the lightning happens, it triggers your camera. It reads it. But to me, that's just cheating. It's just not, it's not fun. It's, it's just not fun. Um, everybody like the Oculus? What's everybody's favorite, Grand Central or the Oculus? Oculus, modern, modern architecture, both are spectacular. Um, I don't think there's a bad angle to the Oculus. There's not a bad time to photograph it. It's got lines, it's got light, it's got uh, repetitive lines, uh, indoors, outdoors. It's just an amazing structure to, to photograph. And I think we're very privileged. Even though they spent a billion and a half dollars you know, on it, uh, of our tax dollars, I think it's still a uh, spectacular you know, building for photographers to work in. What I don't like is the fact that it's a shopping mall and Westfield, who owns it, has turned it into um, a space that is used for uh, events on the floor of the Oculus. And it is, um, it is, you know, when they first built it, it was pristine clean. It was white marble and, and everything was white and, and the, the flow of people and the silhouette of, their, of their, their bodies against the white floor was, I thought, one of the most beautiful things about, about the building. And now they've littered the floor with chairs and pop-up stores and events, and and I think they've they've um, destroyed the character that Santiago Calatrava designed the building to have. And um, I, do, do anybody remember the the white wa the white um, walkway that linked Brookfield Place uh, to under One World Trade Center before the Oculus opened? There was that long white walkway, and it was the most beautiful thing, right? It was like everybody loved that thing. And then what did they do to it? They hung a three-block-long, you know, TV screen for Lay's potato chip ads and and things, and they destroyed the whole aesthetic of the um, of the uh, the walkway. And I remember reading a story that uh, um, the New York Times wrote a story about how they destroyed 
how Westfield destroyed the aesthetic. And Santiago Calatrava said, we never designed this place to be like that. And, and Westfield's response was, somebody's got to pay for this space. So uh, they've, you know, I just hate when, you know, that kind of thing happens. You know, like, like a big building going up and blocking the Empire State Building. You know, you take a beautiful, pristine, you know, beautifully designed uh, piece of architecture and you destroy it by putting uh, advertising on it. Um, again, more moon rises from Liberty State Park. Uh, the tribute and lights. Uh, helicopters, you know, they're, they're the bane of everybody's existence here in New York, right? We hate their noise. We hate, just hate them. Um, they're flying in and out. They're always in your pictures. You do long exposures at night. There's always red lights and white lights going through your skies. But here, you know, it kind of worked. They were circling around the lights. And uh, so, you know, you get lucky one night and uh, you do like a, a one minute exposure or a 30 second, I don't know what it was, but uh, you use them for your, your pictures. Uh, fireworks, one of the things that I was going to mention is you guys realize that there are fireworks in New York almost every week in the summer. Um, uh, it's not just the 4th of July. There are these private uh, um, celebrations all summer long. And if you're interested in fireworks and you're interested in photographing fireworks, the city has a website. Uh, if you just go to Google and search NYC and fireworks, you'll, you'll find an, an nyc.gov uh, website that um, lists all the approved firework shows for the week and you'll see them all summer long you know so you'll you know a lot of people will will write on my twitter feed oh i heard the fireworks and i didn't know what they were i heard the bang i didn't know what they were for and then on twitter they'll see the picture and they go thank you for sharing a picture because now i know why there was a firework but it's all private companies that uh that uh, put on five minute shows like this and they're spectacular you know and those of us that live in jersey have to put up with these fireworks shows we used to have macy's but they're now always on the east river and we have these uh smaller ones uh sunrise in jersey city uh steam everybody loves steam yes. such a beautiful thing about new york right you walk down the street and there's steam clouds and steam pipes you know creating these clouds all over the city i love steam it's like fog right so all this is is a steam pipe at 42nd and 6th and uh, or 43rd and 6th, and this, the Empire State Building is in the background. You just kind of put yourself in the steam, and uh, you can, you know, shroud the Empire State Building. Uh, lightning again. This night, uh, the ultimate for lightning is when you have a dry lightning storm, an electrical storm with no rain, which is what this night was. Uh, the the uh, World Trade Center got hit 23 times in one hour. And, and I was lucky to get 17 of the 23 strikes. So, uh, yes. Do you uh, protect yourself when you're taking lightning pictures? I, I, in Hoboken, usually I shoot from Hoboken, and there's a, a gazebo, so I'm covered. Don't get too wet if it is raining, but it's a metal roof, so it's kind of stupid, but uh, <laughs> you stay dry. Uh, uh, the closest the lightning's ever come, I go out for like every lightning storm, and the closest it's ever come was uh, there was one bolt that hit the middle of the Hudson River, and I was like right on the edge of the river, and then there was another one that hit a building at Stevens Institute of Technology, which is up on, a, on a, uh, an elevated position in Hoboken, and, and it hit the top of the building. So uh, it, it, it's close, but not uh, that close to me. But, uh, and then there's another place in Jersey City that I go, there's a restaurant in Jersey City that has a patio that's covered right across from uh, World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan. But I've never been really hit and I've never been, I never felt too much danger, but uh, you know, it's, it's just, there's too much of a desire to go out and try to get this picture to, to stay home. Yep. Um, again, back in Weehawken, you know, Weehawken, this park here is uh, weddings, Quincieras, uh, everything. Everybody wants to have their picture taken in front of New York City. That is a fact. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's never ending. Um, that's from the lower tip of Manhattan, down in Battery Park, just uh, shooting. Um, you know, the sun, uh, certain, there's a, there's a week or two in, in the winter where the uh, late winter, you know, like January, where the sun sets behind the statue um, for about a week. And then after that week, because the sun is now, you know, after December 31st, sorry, December 21st, the sun is now setting one minute to the north every day until, until the first day of summer. Uh, as it sets to the north, you've got to start moving from lower tip of Manhattan across, say, the Manhattan Bridge, and then into Brooklyn, and then down south in Brooklyn all the way to Red Hook, you know. So the app 
shows you the path and it can, you can figure out where to stand. So one of my favorite pictures, you know, is, is shooting through the Brooklyn Bridge to the, the uh, Statue of Liberty with the sun setting behind it. And you have to shoot that from the Manhattan Bridge. You have literally about five days in January to do that. And then it just, it's gone until, you know, the, this, until like six or seven months later when the, the sun is starting to make its way back. Um, this is, um, you know, I got two of these because I just saw one the other day. Uh, this is sunset. This, you'll remember this one. It's moonrise. Uh, I love moonrises at sunset. Um, one of the things that I can, one of the tips I can tell you is if you're standing next to the Hudson River in Jersey City and you want to shoot a moonrise or a moon near the World Trade Center, it takes exactly 90 minutes for the, the moon to make its way to the top of the World Trade Center. So if, if it says the, the, the moon is um, rising at, uh, sorry, the sun is setting at 5.30 or 6 o'clock, uh, and the moon is rising at uh, 4, say the moon rises at 4, sun sets at 5.30, at, at 5.30 the moon will be at the top of the World Trade Center. It takes 90 minutes to get to the top of the, uh, the World Trade Center. So I go out, you know, there's one day every month where, where the, uh, the moon's, uh, position at the top of the World Trade Center will be exactly at the top when the sun is setting. And, and I always make sure it's not a full moon, it's about three days before the full moon. What is that? That is, um, uh, it's a ferry dock for New York Waterway, Harborside Ferry Dock in, in Jersey City. It's a walkway that goes out to where the boat dock. Um, I'll show you another one at sunrise that I shot just uh, two days ago. So. Um, Yesterday, oh sorry, yesterday, it's at the end. Um, again, shooting through things, you know, put something, you know, interesting in front of your, your, your subject and you'll, you'll um, make a little more interesting photograph. Uh, so this is, for me, one of the ultimates in shooting a moonrise in New York. The distance from where I'm standing to the World Trade Center is 25 miles. Uh, it's a place called Washington Rock Park. It's in Greenbrook Township in, in, in uh, New Jersey. It's, uh, and if you're familiar with um, Bridge uh, Water, you know, it's just before Bridge Water. It's a long way, 25 miles. Uh, I tried to get this picture for four years. No joke. You know, it, it rarely lines up in this, uh, in this uh, alignment where the moon comes up behind the World Trade Center uh, on a full moon. It does line up on smaller moons, but on a full moon. The last two times, uh, it was like a year and a half ago and then a year and a half ago before that, they were cloudy nights. So uh, this was shot in October and I had been waiting like almost four years to, to try and get that picture. So, you know, yes. Am I mistaken or is that moon, is that moon flattened? I mean, it's squashed. Sort yeah, of. you know, one of, one of the things one of the things about photographing the moon when it's it, one with a telephoto lens, it, it compresses everything, so it's a it's a, a six or an eight hundred millimeter lens, and and when the moon is rising just on the horizon, there's a lot of gunk in the air that squished the moon, so it's it, it's it's exactly how it looks but it, it flattens it and squish, sometimes it squishes it down and you don't get a perfect round, you know, it's all got to do with the atmospheric conditions and the, uh, the lens that you're using. Correct. Um, look at this light, this is crazy. Rainstorm went through and uh, the, the black clouds are behind the city and the sun came out, you know, from, from Liberty State Park. It was just one of those weird and wacky nights. That's why you go out every night because that happens, you know, you can't plan for this. You know, you can, you, you, you sort of can plan for it if you look at the weather app and you look at the radar and it says, you know, the sun is supposed to come out around five o'clock and, and the storm will move through. You can watch the clouds on the radar app move through and so you can sort of plan for that. One of the things that you can plan for are rainbows. You know, you can almost, uh, you, can, you can time the, the, the sun set uh, say, for example, when you think the sun's going to set and when a storm's going to pass through, and you can almost predict a rainbow by looking at the apps. Um, clouds at sunset over the city. Uh, this is way up in Edgewater, uh, way up the river in Edgewater, looking back, you know, stacking up uh, all the new buildings on the west side of Manhattan. 
Hudson Yards, uh, World Trade Center. Uh, fog again, a rainy, foggy night over uh, Times Square, and you get all this color that, that, that you know, fills up the, uh, the sky. Uh, more steam, rainy night with a steam cloud on West Broadway. You know, it was a helping hand. I spent a lot of time with the seagulls in Hoboken. You know, they're my buddies. <laughs> I don't feed them. I don't uh, do anything with them. But every once in a while, you get a, you get a seagull that's just not scared of you. And that, that camera couldn't have been more than about, you know, this far from its face. And uh, I love the birds. I really do. S reflections and snow. That's the Millennial, Millennial Hotel in uh, lower Manhattan. Uh, Jersey City. Uh, our parade, everybody goes, you know, I love the parade. It just, it doesn't really fit in all the stuff I do, but I just love the parade. It's a lot of fun. Uh, here's another example of a moonrise that I had waited like four years to shoot. Uh, there's a street in the docks of Newark uh, where this is shot. It's probably six to seven miles from where I'm standing to the Empire State Building. Um, I've always liked these homes, you know, that are in... Uh, Jersey City. I'm standing in Newark. The homes are in uh, in, in Jersey City. Uh, there's water. There's a big body of water between me and the homes. And then uh, you've got all of Jersey City, and then into Manhattan. And there's one street in the docks that you have a perfect view of Lower Manhattan and uh, Midtown Manhattan. And and rarely does the moon, a full moon, rise with the Empire State Building if you were standing in this one spot. You know, you know, just think how long you have to wait. You, you pick a spot that you know is going to be perfect. How long will it take for the moon? How many months, years will it take for the moon to actually go through its orbits and actually line up with that one specific structure? So uh, I'd been there a couple other times. It was cloudy, you know, a couple other times, you know, over the years. But uh, this happened in November. So if it's, if it's clear on Wednesday night next week, I'm going to go to the same place, but I'm going to do it behind the World Trade Center. It's going to line up with the World Trade Center. Okay. Um, sunrise. This is Bayonne, New Jersey. Um, there's uh, anybody know of the teardrop 9/11 memorial in Bayonne? You are maybe you and me and Katrina are maybe the only ones. You know there is this giant 9/11 memorial donated to the U.S. by Russia that sits at the end of a cargo dock in Bayonne, New Jersey. Nobody knows it's there. Nobody goes there. The gates are never locked. They never shut it. But you have this view of New York City from there. No picture that I ever put on Instagram or Twitter or any social media elicits more comments of fake photography than this picture. Because it's just incredible. Everybody goes, that is so fake. The Statue of Liberty does not sit in Midtown Manhattan. You know, and they write, people write this. They can't figure out how you can possibly, it doesn't line up, it's not possible, blah, 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 blah. But that's the exact view that you get um, from Bayonne, New Jersey, and this dock. You know, it all lines up really nicely. Unfortunately, Harry Mackelow built that horrible building that we all hate more than any other building in New York. Um, one of the nice things that is, you know, happening is where those two cranes are on the right, that's the new building next to Grand Central Station called One Vanderbilt. And it's now up high, and it's going to be like a 90-story building. And in many angles from South Jersey, whether it's Bayonne or Liberty State Park, it's, it's now balancing out that, that horrible white building, you know, so that one building's on one side of the Empire State Building, one building's on the other side, and it's starting to have a little more balanced feel, and, and it's, less, it's less annoying to see uh, 432 Park Avenue there. Uh, Times Square, um, in the rain, uh, just light, you know, again, another, you know, just going out every night, you know, you never know what color the light's going to be. Typically, there's no day to shoot a sunset worse than a blue sky, cloudless day. The, there's nothing in the sky that retains the light. There's, um, um, the, the sun goes down, the light goes away so fast. Uh, you want some cloud cover. You want some patchy, broken clouds to, to turn orange and then illuminate the city. This night, I don't know where this light came from, but uh, there was moisture in the air. You know, uh, and when you talk about moisture in the air, you're talking about in the high atmosphere. There's uh, moisture in the high atmosphere. It's ice crystals. And your color comes from the sun refracting through the ice crystals and, and creating the light. 
just like a prism, you know, that you can, you can have. Um, this picture is uh, sunrise. Uh, I, I love this picture because it, it shows you how empty One World Trade Center is, you know. The, uh, the whole middle part of the World Trade Center is not rented. You can see the elevator banks, and you can see, you can see how all these floors, there's, there's, there's occupants here and here. There's no occupants here because they put no walls up. There's, it's not built out for offices. So when the sun comes up behind it, it just burns right through the building, and you can see all the way to the elevator banks. It's pretty weird. Um, Again, Lower Manhattan, the, uh, the cranes are on the piers in Bayonne. That's from, uh, from Battery Park. Uh, that's the view from Hoboken. It's a terrible view. It's not, you know, worth living in Hoboken because it's so ugly, right? <laughs> um, fog again, foggy night in New York. Uh, Hudson Yards. Um, you know, this is, a, you know, this is another uh, example, you know, where, where I, I always, I try to have people in as many pictures as I can. You know, I like silhouettes. I like the scale. I like to, you know, have something in there other than just a, just a building. And um, um, again, you know, that's from Hoboken. You wait for the light. Somebody runs by. You get, you know, you get lucky that they, uh, they ran through your picture. You know, there's a walkway up the center of this park. Usually they go all the way around and you would never see them. So um, I've been photographing this, uh, this development for, for you know, years and years. And, and you realize this is only half, right? Five buildings are going to be another five buildings to the north that they've already started, you know, started building. Um, and um, you guys, are you familiar with this thing up here? That, they just named it the other day. They announced it's now called The Edge. It's an outdoor observation deck at the uh, 100th floor of that building, 30 Hudson Yards. It's not going to open for another year, uh, but it's outdoors at 100 floors up. It's going to be spectacular to, uh, to, to see. I spent a lot of times in subway entrances. I like, uh, I like the view from low looking up, the ultimate view. Um, that's at uh, um, 8th Avenue and uh, 34th. Again, Hudson Yards. Katrine owns this view <laughs> from where she lives. She sees this every day. And it's uh, beautiful, the stuff that, that you do there. Uh, oh, geez, I looked out my office window one day, and that's what I saw, again, at work. So uh, you never know, right? This is the light that, that comes and goes in New York City. Um, again, Manhattan Hinge. So this is the high view uh, uh, from, from the, uh, the top of uh, uh, the bluff in, we in Weehawken. You saw the low view before. Which one do you like better? You like high or low? I can never figure out or decide whether I should go high or low when this happens. I'm, I'm partial more to the high view rather than the low view. What do you guys think? I agree. You agree? Yeah? Yeah. It's, uh, it's quite, quite nice place to be. Trees, you know, nothing like trees and the branches in the winter. More steam in New York. It's everywhere. Everywhere you look, steam is everywhere. Wait for the cars to illuminate it. You know, just hang out on the, uh, the street for a little bit. Uh, again, sunset. I think she looks great, whether it's the front or the back. You know, I don't get to the front very often because you've got to go to, like, to Red Hook in Brooklyn, which is a, a long hike and an expensive, you know, with the tolls on the bridges and stuff, or the fair, I mean, the, the tunnels. But um, the, uh, that was the eclipse in January. Um, sunset on Chinatown. Um, snow. You know, the biggest, uh, the biggest trick in, in the biggest cliche trick in the world is find something black to shoot the snow against and use a slow shutter speed. It makes it look like a bigger blizzard than it really is. And um, it, uh, these doormen are out there in the front of, uh, you know, rain or snow. The doormen at the Empire State Building never go inside. They're always out there. So they're a good, they're a good model to, uh, to use when it's snowing out. Uh, sometimes you just stand in the middle of the street like an idiot. And people look at you like, what are you doing? You know, to get, uh, to get something and hope that, you know, a car doesn't come screaming around the corner there making a left turn and take you out. Um, sunrise in Jersey City. Uh, sunset, this was Super Bowl night. Um, everybody said the orange or the red was, uh, was uh, uh, it foreshadowed the Patriots winning that night. A lot of, you know, Patriot fans, you know, liking that picture. Yes. Five minutes? Yeah, I'm right at the end here. So uh, again, hey, I looked out the window of my office again, and uh, there was this beautiful streaming 
uh, it was a kind of like a foggy morning and all this light came down 48th Street and it was just a beautiful feel to it. Um, we all know this view. I, I, I really only have it in here because apparently we're going to lose this view. What? They, um, you know, over by side the Manhattan Bridge, there's a building called uh, One Manhattan Square that, that is right beside the Manhattan Bridge. And it's over here. And they've just approved three more buildings to be built to the north of One Manhattan Square. And there's going to be one here, like one here, and one right there. So there's a big battle going on about, um, it's a big battle going on right now about, um, about whether or not they should have uh, approved those building permits. Um, this was uh, uh, an Instagram uh, meetup inside a $25,000 a month uh, apartment at, on Murray Street in Lower Manhattan. Um, real estate agents in this town uh, bring Instagram photographers together in the hope that they'll publicize the apartment that is, uh, that is uh, for rent. Um, a week after this Instagram meet, they actually rented the building. I, the, the real estate agent likes to think it's because of his photographers that he brought in there to, to photograph it and show the view. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get lucky, a dog jumps in front of you. You never know. Um, this is sunrise from uh, uh, Eagle Rock. Uh, again, uh, Weehawken. Spent a lot of time in Weehawken. Um, that's uh, the um, a super moon. This was, uh, this was one, the supermoon rising one night. This is the same moon setting the next morning. Uh, so this is from Hoboken. This is from um, Red Hook in Brooklyn. Big light bulb. It looks like a light bulb. Again, the reflective light. Um, Grand Central. Another thing, you know, is trying, you can never predict when that light's going to come through. That's uh, sunset. And the light is reflecting off a building, probably the Grand Hyatt on the other side. Chrysler Building, reflections. Um, Billionaire's Row. Uh, yes? I just walked past that building, so that's being built at One Vanderbilt. Um, is, that, is One Vanderbilt going to block that light of that of that window, because I, uh, I always love the light coming through those oh windows. Oh no, one Vanderbilt um, is further. It's it's going to affect the sunset light potentially uh, coming in the uh, the west windows of the uh, yeah yeah entirely possible yeah exactly. Uh, so uh, the building that uh, so the building in the center there, the tall one that is um, uh, almost this is about 200 feet short of where it's going to end up. It's going to be the tallest residential building in the world. It's called Central Park Tower. It's going to be 1,550 feet tall. It's going to have the highest apartment in the world. It's going to have the highest roof in, um, in uh, the Western Hemisphere. And, and, you know, One World Trade Center, you know, is the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere at 1776, but the roof is only 1,400 feet. So this building here is going to be... Um, it's going to be 1,550 feet tall. It's just crazy. So I would like to know is... You know, this is the building uh, that sold the top penthouse for $238 million a few weeks ago, but it was a triplex. It's the top three floors for one building. What's that going to be? You know, what's the price tag on the apartment that says, I'm living higher than anybody else in the world? You know, I just can't imagine how many, you know, $300 million? I don't know. It's crazy. Um, you know, these are right at the end here. Um, that, was, uh, that was Saturday morning last week, and... Uh, the same picture that I showed you before with the moon, this is the sun rising. And uh, I think that's the last one. Yep. So. All right, excellent pictures. Did you do anything for the solar eclipse? Uh, yes, I did. Uh, in fact, um, uh, how can I show it to you? Um, I'll see if I can find it. I, I purposely stayed in New York City uh, for the solar eclipse. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you in. I'll, I know where I can show it to you. I think I have. Um, um, I don't know if I. Oh, no, maybe I don't. Oh, maybe I do. Um, I have a book coming out. So finally, I have a book coming out in July that is going to be only on the sun and the moon. I'm going to have another book come out next year that's all the other pictures of New York City. But we're going to we're going to time a book in July to the 50th anniversary of uh, Man on the Moon. 
and and the book's going to be about uh, celestial events that have happened, you know, that happened over New York City. So I don't know if I have. Uh... So I specifically stayed in New York City to do this because I wanted this picture to be in the book that I knew eventually that I would do. While all the other photographers in town, all the Instagram photographers ran down to North Carolina and went across the country to photograph the black dot in the sky, I stayed in New York. I knew that the, the eclipse was going to pass right over the Empire State Building, standing on the corner of 36th and 5th. And, and sure enough, it, it was exactly where it was supposed to be. And I was happy to have been able, I was happy that there were clouds. It was, it was almost an impossible picture to take because you're using a solar filter, which is making it orange. And you're using a solar filter and it's going to, the solar filter is going to, you know, drop your exposure so far down that the buildings are going to be dark. You know, if the sun was out full, the building's going to be dark when you're exposed for the sun. So the clouds helped even out the exposure a lot. And, and between the filter and the, the sun in the clouds, I was able to keep both the silhouette of the Empire State Building and the, um, and the, uh, the sun in the same frame. So I was happy to uh, have stayed and, and got that. It was about 73% mm -hmm. uh, covered, you know, so a crescent sun. I thought it was quite nice. You know, I, I was happy that I stayed and didn't go off and try to do the black dot in the sky. Mm -hmm. All along, were you working towards a book, or once never. the book is published, is it the end of the project? No. Continues regardless. Uh, no, no, the project never ends. Um, the the city is going through the biggest construction boom right now that it has gone through since uh, the 1920s and 30s, when the um, uh, Chrysler Building was built, when the uh, Empire State Building was built. And um, the fact that the second phase of uh, Hudson Yards is just starting to come up out of the ground uh, out of their foundations uh, means that the, uh, the next two or three years are, are going to be um, a great opportunities to add to the project. You know, for me, it's really about a 10-year project, 2011 to 2021 kind of thing. And so no, no intention of stopping uh, what I'm doing. And um, uh, I'm out there trying to, you know, shoot pictures every day to add to, you know, I have until like uh, the end of March to keep adding to this book. And I want, to, I, I want it, when it comes out, to have as fresh material as I, as I can. Yeah. Did you start out just sort of following your obsessions? Because this does, I mean, I'm fascinated with this. It takes a certain kind of mind that will follow yeah. all of, you know, the phases of the moon and where you can see it. Were you just initially following these obsessions and hunting down these shots? Well, the, it, it, it's, it all started with, okay, so in, in the summer of 2011, I figured out that there's beautiful light out there that I had never realized existed. So that started my following the sun and the sunset. And then the moonrise in May of 2000, the supermoon in 2012, made me fall in love with moonrises. And, and I um, just became obsessed with it then. Right. And, and like I say, the beautiful thing about the moon is you look at the app, it tells you where to stand. It says that the moon is going to rise at 552 p.m. You get there at 545 and you leave at six o'clock. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing takes 15 minutes because after the moon gets up to a certain height, it's done because it just turns too bright and it's a white. So I love this kind of photography because it's short and sweet. You know, and you don't really spend a lot of time at it. And um, it's, it's just how I've always worked. You know, when I was a sports photographer, I loved going to the game, shooting for a few minutes and going into the dark room and developing the film and getting the first pictures out on the wire, you know, when I worked at Reuters. And, and I was done, right? I didn't have to stay for the whole game, you know. And I find this kind of photography the same thing. It's frustrating that, you know, you're planning for this big moon and it's cloudy. And you get there and it's cloudy or it's raining and you don't go out at all. But... Uh, um, it takes so little time and it's so easy to move to, to the places from where I live in Jersey to shoot them that um, I, I, it's, it's an obsession to go out and do it a lot, but the effort to go do it is very minimal. So, you know. And the second part to that, were you looking for a book deal or did somebody approach you? Uh, no, I was uh, never looking for a book deal. I always hoped someday the whole package of pictures that I've shot would be a book deal one day. Um, but it, it came to me. 
the publisher is uh, uh, PSG in Chicago, Warren Winter. Is, uh, Warren uh, publishes photo books. Uh, he did the book on Hillary Clinton last year uh, for Barbara Kinney. He did uh, two books with the Louisville Curry Journal on the Kentucky Derby and Muhammad Ali, just magnificent books. He did a fantastic book with uh, Vincent Laforea, a former New York Times photographer called Air. Vincent shot New York City and other cities around the world from a helicopter at 10,000 feet. Uh, and so Warren, uh, Warren was a great, uh, I, I knew him, he was a friend. He had mentioned to me two years ago that um, um, uh, he'd like to do a book eventually. Then he got really busy doing other projects and I never, I didn't, I saw him but I, we never talked about the book. And then one morning, uh, Robert Kaplan, a mutual friend, you know, uh, asked me if uh, he could share one of my pictures on uh, the Photo Brigade uh, Instagram feed. And he said, you know, it was like 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning, and he said, where's your book? I said, I don't know, Warren, you know, I don't know when Warren's going to get around to doing it, but, uh, and Warren's a mutual friend. And about 30 seconds later, I got a text from Warren, let's do the book. Because Robert, you know, said to Warren, where's the book? You know, and so this was in late January. And, and we've, gone from, we've gone from nothing in late January to having like 19 layouts. We're on like, I'm waiting for version 20. And he had a cover and a back cover picked in about two hours that Sunday afternoon. And, and just fast, really. And hopefully this week we're going to launch a website for uh, pre-sales. And, and he's the kind of publisher who, who determines how many copies to print based off of the pre-sales that he gets on the website. And he's really big on, on, on getting the, the book out into the social, the, the idea of the book out into the social media world to see if he can get a lot of pre-sales and it helps him decide how many to Hi. Um, I was wondering, so a lot of the photography that you've taken beforehand has been very political or right. obviously sports. There's a lot of different feelings about whatever it is that you are photographing. Right. And I'm sure more vocal, you know, as, you know, things with Trump have come along, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had a similar experience when you were photographing these or a very different, and that's the reason why you were kind of pushed away from, you know, what, what, how do they differ when it well, comes to responses that you get? The, okay, so when you're covering news, you know, you're, you're riding a real high in photography, you know, you're at the summit or you're at the Olympics. I did 17 Olympic games, so, you know, you're at all these big events and your pictures are being published on the front pages or sport front pages or just in newspapers or websites all over the world. Um, you know, maybe Sports Illustrated uses a picture of yours or maybe Time Magazine does and it is an enormous high. It's just an incredible high and, it, and it's, uh, it's an adrenaline rush. And, and you push yourself to be as good as you can because the better you are, the more you get published. And there, there got to be a time, though, later in my career. I, I left Reuters in 2014. And, and as we approached, you know, the mid, uh, the first decade, 2008, 2007 in there, uh, I started to realize that, that photography, news photography, wasn't necessarily about the best picture you could take. It was about who could transmit the, their pictures the fastest. So photography for me became um, 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 this, this profession that was, that was pushing out bad pictures quickly. And those bad pictures were getting published. And the great pictures were not getting published. And, and you know, in my, one of the things that I've noticed in my capacity as a photo editor for a website now, a news website, we publish a lot of bad pictures because they fit holes that we have. And a lot of the great pictures that are taken out don't fit into these terrible holes that exist on websites. So um, I got really tired of the whole journalism thing and, and working to a deadline. The problem is digital photography accelerated the speed by which you could get your picture from you and your camera to the publisher who wanted to put it on their front page of the website. So I got really bored with that somewhat, and I, I knew it was time to get out of the business. And, and I wanted to get out as early as 2012, and, and it didn't happen until actually 2014. And, and once I left, um, I completely left that life behind and, and completely threw myself into this New York photography. And the difference is I walk around the city, I mean, like today was a perfect example, uh, I left the office at like 3 o'clock, and I had to be here at 
And I went for a walk over to the High Line and Hudson Yards, and I looked at the light, and and you know, I was it's what I do at the end of the, you know, it's what I do in the afternoon. And I, I now take pictures that I want to take for myself, and I take pictures that I want to share with uh, people on social media, and and I'm and I'm, I'm getting as much of an adrenaline rush or thrill when I take a nice picture and put it on social media and people comment on it and engage with that picture directly. I no longer have to rely on, say, the New York Times or NBCNews.com to use a picture of mine because they may not. You know, maybe the photographer from AP or Getty has a better one or they got it out faster. And so my photographs aren't seen by anybody. So the, the beauty of social media and Instagram and, and all the, the, the different platforms is you're self-publishing. You're self-publishing what is uh, important to you and what you like. And, and, and you will make a connection with your audience. And I, I, I love the fact that I can put a picture on Twitter. I use both Twitter and Instagram um, the same. If I put a picture on Instagram, it, all, it automatically, I, I put it on Twitter also. And, and they're two completely different sets of, uh, of followers. And, and it's like the people that, that follow me on Instagram don't follow me on Twitter. And those on Twitter only follow me on Twitter because that's what they use and they don't really use Instagram. But the, the communication that you get, it's thrilling, you know, to have. Uh, I remember uh, recently, uh, well, um, back in, in the fall, I should say, uh, a mother, you know, sent me a direct message. And it's a lot of direct messages, not just uh, messages, you know, in the comment section of your pictures. Uh, you know, she said, I just dropped my, my daughter off at school in New York and I'm back home in Kentucky and, and you know, I see your pictures every day and it makes me closer to my daughter because I, 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 can, I can see what's going on in New York today. And I'm, I'm crazy enough to post every day. And it's really simple. We live in a city where everywhere you go, I have a camera in my pocket, you turn a corner to some beautiful light, you photograph it, or you just take a little different walk to the, the, the subway, you know, every day down a different street, and you come up with something that, uh, you know, is, is, is nice. But people are waiting for those pictures. They want to see what the sunset looks like. A lot of uh, people around the world dream about coming to New York who've never been here. They, they just, you know, I, they, and they comment endlessly about how I look at your pictures and I, it's my dream to come to that city. You know, and, and the ones that really get to me are, are the people who are ex-New Yorkers. Because I can't imagine what it's going to be like or what it's like for anybody to go through New York withdrawal by moving away from this city. I just don't know what that would be like. You know, I leave it for a week and I, I, I'm like crazy. After two days, I want to go home just because I feel like I'm, I'm missing something in New York. And, and uh, people will say to me, you know, usually in a direct message, you know, I lived in New York for 20 years. I can't live there anymore. I just can't afford it. It's a city like Billionaire's Row, and uh, it's a city that I can't afford. So I live my New York experience through your photographs. So I get, I get just as much um, enjoyment and happiness out of knowing that people are looking at these pictures and waiting for them. And after a week when I'm on vacation, they're sending me messages going, are you okay? You know, are you, are you okay? You know, we, we miss your pictures. You know, we just want to make sure you're, you're not, you know, ill or anything like that. So it's, it's a different happiness than seeing it on the front of the New York Times, but it's, it's as important as it ever was being uh, published in, in the media. So what's the camera in your pocket? Oh, give me the mic. Oh, um, where is it? Let me get it out. Uh, the camera in my pocket is uh, the Canon G7X. It's a little camera. It's got a 28 to 70 zoom. I leave it on P for professional. <laughs> and, and just, you know, push the button. And uh, it's incredible how good. There's an equivalent camera this size that Sony makes called an RX100. Version 6 they're up to. <laughs> we have our battle between the Sony and the Canon. They're both spectacular cameras, but the smaller the camera, the more likely it is you're going to carry it with you. So um, the other reason that I use a camera and not the phone is all the pictures that I take are distributed through Getty Images, and so they sell the pictures. You know, the real, you know, it's the, the, the work that I do isn't just because I want to share it with the world and put it on, on Instagram and let people see it. There's also uh, a desire for publications to, 
to use it also. Like yesterday, I took a walk for an hour around Hudson Yards to, to photograph it. Um, it's opening, so it's in the news. And so uh, two of the pictures I saw on Yahoo News this morning. They bought them from Getty. You know, they downloaded them from Getty. So there's a, there's a, a reason also for, you know, a real reason for, uh, for taking the pictures too. I still like, I st as much as I like to see them on, on um, Instagram and Twitter and, 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 and engage with the audience, uh, I also like to see them in, in print, in, in the news media. And, and, but the difference is I'm on my time. I'm not on an assignment, I'm not on a deadline, I'm not being told what to do. If I take a picture and give it to them, they're happy. If I don't have a picture on a given day, Getty, you know, is happy with that too. So, but that's, it's such a, you know, at my age, it's, I've done everything and I, I like the, the calmness of just being out on the street on my own, you know, doing my own thing. I was actually going to ask about your licensing and what, what kind of income right. stream you can make from that, but also I'll add to it since you addressed it a little bit. Is I know some buildings like the Chrysler building um, need property releases. I heard or something. Can you talk to that? Yeah. So uh, licensing. I, I, I'm sorry. Property releases. Um, you only need a property release. Property release. If the picture is being used commercially, meaning an advertisement, and if that uh, building that's in your picture is the pre predominant part of the picture. So if you have a picture of, you know, like, like that one on the top left of Hudson Yards, it can't be sold for an advertised use without Hudson Yards uh, releasing it and, and being paid a royalty for it because they own the copyright or the, uh, to the look of the building. If you have a wide image of the skyline, Hudson Yards is in it, the, the um, Time Warner Center, Central Park Tower, and um, the Empire State Building, you don't need a release because it is a generic, you know, wide image. It's not, you know, focused on, uh, there's, no, there's no property release to the city of New York for it, the look of its skyline. They don't own that, nobody owns that. But only if uh, the building is like by itself or one of two maybe. So, uh, and as far as licensing and stuff go, like I say, everything, everything I shoot goes to um, Getty. Uh, whereas, you know, maybe I'll put, you know, one picture on Instagram, Getty will get 10 or 12 of the same thing. You know, that's uh, last night's take in and around uh, Hudson Yards. You know, I actually did a little five-picture show on, on Instagram with, with five of these. But, uh, you know, uh, another example is, uh, you know, I put this picture on Instagram, for example, and I then did another slideshow. But you can see all the sunrise pictures that I shot yesterday morning. There's a lot of uh, choice. This is uh, sunrise on Saturday morning. Um, there's a lot of choice. You know, and there's a lot of uh, photographs like like this. This is one Vanderbilt being being built. I'm trying to I'm trying to leave behind. You know, the the, the part of the project that really matters is leaving behind a visual record uh, in a in an archive that is online searchable. The pictures are easily found, and 25 years from now they become historical images and they hopefully will be easily found. Try finding, you know, a lot of pictures of the, the building of the Empire State Building, you know. They were taken, but they just don't, they're not accessible. They're somewhere, but they're hard to find. So, so you know, Getty has given me the opportunity to, to do whatever I want with the skyline, with what's happening in New York, and, and, and they'll accept all these pictures. And they all, they all sell about 300, 325 a month of these pictures. The photographs of New York City around the world are used to, uh, to illustrate um, um, finance stories, immigration stories, uh, real estate, um, just, you know, you name it. Pick a topic out of the air and there'll be uh, something about New York City that, uh, that will um, be used to illustrate that story. So, you know, there's just so much choice. You know, this is all one night shooting. You know, there's just so many versions. And, and what's really important that when you publish these pictures that you put as much information into the caption and as many keywords as you possibly can. And you have to name the buildings. Like this one here in the middle, this is, uh, this one here is the new uh, Bjork Engels uh, um, building called the Eleven. And, and so that's in the caption. Bjork Engel's name, so that if somebody searches this, this, the architect of the moment, you know, they'll find all the pictures. You know, Central Park Tower will be named, Time Warner Center, 
This is 220 uh, Central Park South. This is um, um, this building is 111 West 57th Street. You know, and these are all iconic new buildings being added to the skyline. Um, you know, this. Uh, you know, this. Um, for example, you've got. This building is going to be the tallest residential building in the world. This building is being referred to as the narrowest skyscraper in the world. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's like this wide. And it's 100 floors tall, and it's got 46 apartments in it. You know, almost every apartment's a duplex, you know. And it's unique. It's, it's a unique addition, this pencil-thin building, you know. And, and it's going to be in the news as they start to complete it because they're putting an 800 ton weight on the roof of it so that it won't fall over you know and sway in the wind is so narrow so I mean these are these are technology marvels in the construction industry that will eventually be written about so it's nice to have a visual record you know for the ages and and um, that is what really fuels my desire is to is to keep this going and to keep adding because the skyline is really not going to stop for, for a long time. And what happens is a new building, you know, there's a, for example, you know, I've been shooting, I've been shooting, you know, views of uh, lower Manhattan for forever. Uh, I don't know if it's in this picture or not, but um, you can see here, there's a crane now here. It's a building on uh, Greenwich, 125 Greenwich Street in, in Lower Manhattan. It's, it's 80 floors tall. It's a new addition to Manhattan skyline. So all the pictures that I've taken, say, three, four months ago when you couldn't see that building are basically archived now. Nobody's going to buy those pictures. They're going to only want to buy a picture that has the latest you know, and greatest uh, view. So that's another reason that that's another motivation and inspiration to keep going out because um, um, you know, what happens on the skyline of New York is, you know, within a, within a few months, um, within a few months, uh, see here, so this is, a, this is a skyline picture, like for example, from Lower Manhattan, there's the new building. It wasn't there a few months ago. So you got to go back and now photograph it in various light, sunrise, and, and the windows aren't up to the top yet. Soon they will be. That'll be a whole other look. Once the windows are at the top, nobody wants this picture. It becomes uh, useless. It's just archival, you know. So uh, Central Park Tower is the dominant, you know, building in New York at the moment, no question about it. And and you know, waiting and waiting and waiting for, um, waiting for this building to get glassed up, all the way to the top, and then all these windows here, are they're all covered in blue plastic. They got somebody's got to go on the outside of that building and pull these protective sheets off every window for a hundred and five floors or so. You know, so, um, you know, what happens to all that plastic? It's like the whole building will be encased in it, every window. So, so it'll be a different look. And once the windows go all the way to the top, these, build, these pictures won't even be considered to be published for, you know, 50 years. Gary, we have to stop on yes. that note. We'll have to wonder <laughs> about that plastic. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.